Thank you all for being here on a Friday afternoon, especially to students who may be here even without extra credit. Um, thank you, Gate Institute, uh, Chris Heckler, uh, Aaron Sizer, uh, and, and Ms. Iverson for hounding me on email. I'm not the, always the best at responding, so I really appreciate your uh, continual uh, surveillance. <laughs> uh, I also want to say that, that I approach this, this invitation with much trepidation, uh, Westmont being um, uh, an evangelical school and me, me being a uh, Southern Baptist in recovery, one day at a time. Uh, you know, I didn't quite know what to expect, but was very, very, very pleased uh, when I came the first afternoon to hear the, yesterday, to hear the plenary and just scope out and see uh, what, what the scene was going to be and whether or not I needed to wear a tie today and read from a formal paper. Fortunately for you, uh, it's not going to be that case. In fact, I want to take very seriously the call for a more interactive conversational style of presentation. So I don't have a paper, I have notes, but mostly I have images for you. And what I'd like to do today is to talk about um, lessons I've learned from uh, being in basically two fields. One in ethnic studies, where I got my PhD, and then at Berkeley, and then religious studies, where I got my BA and my master's. So I'm kind of this hybrid creature uh, that has a lot of work to do, and you know, keeping lots of things in the air. Um, so uh, I should also say that if I go a few minutes under 45 minutes, you won't be angry. <laughs> okay, and and you know, and please ask questions. I'm going to ask you to participate for this for just this first part. Um, so, here we go. So this is an image of a woman in 1894 in Grangeville or Warren, Idaho, rural Idaho. And I would like, and this is a slide that I show the very first day of my class in Asian American, my 200 student class of Introduction to Asian American Religion. Uh, which I will be teaching in a couple of weeks. So, so I will treat you as my, as, my, as my students for the first day of class, and I will, I will ask you what I ask them the very first day. Tell me what this picture is about. Okay, so you know this course is a course on Asian American religion. So, so given that information, you tell me what this picture is. What year is it? 1894. Warren, Idaho. Bustling war in Idaho. <laughs> any comments? Any any observations? Victorian dress. Victorian dress. Okay. Uh, any of any particular meaning or style? Conservative. Conservative. Uncomfortable. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, this uh, this this photograph is they didn't have color back then, so we don't really know what color this dress is. Although most people assume that it's black. We can talk about that in a bit. Any other suggestions as to what, what this photograph is about? Yes? I heard it's, it's a little bit faint, but there was right hand that was on a, a large text. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, OK. So, she, so her, her right hand is on, a, is on a very large book. OK? And true to form, I, I was counting the seconds. Somebody in the audience will say, her hand is on a book. What is this book? Westmont, come on. <laughs> okay, so, may, so maybe this book is a Bible. Okay, what else do you see? Is that a cross? She may have a, ne a necklace with a cross on it. We're, we, we, we can't really see it that well, but most people think that it's a cross, or maybe that's because of the context we're in, right? She's in a cabin, right? It's a very kind of strange setting. You can see the, the logs on the side, and then she's got this hay underneath, right? right? So, this, so, it's, so it seems to be a staged photograph. Right? Anybody else? Or let me ask this question. What is the interpretation or, or the most likely interpretation of this text? Not necessarily of the individual items, but taken together, this photograph would, would seem to indicate Missionary. Uh, her is a missionary, or someone else is a missionary. Okay, so maybe she's a missionary, and she's and she's got her her sword, right? Her lightsaber, right? 
I can speak this language. Okay. Anybody? I'm sorry? A ritual event, perhaps. Okay? Anybody at last, last chance to, to chime in? She's a convert. She's a convert. And, a, and, as, a, and as, a, as an Asian woman with her hand on a book that might be the Bible in a very uncomfortable Victorian dress. Westernized. Westernized Bible. What narrative might this image fit into? The narrative of Americanization. The uh, Chinese began to arrive in the 1850s, 1849 really, uh, and then, by, and then by, by the time this picture is taken in 1904, there are Chinese throughout the West. There is a, a, a mining center in near Warren, Warren uh, Idaho, where this woman ended up. Okay? Anybody know who this woman is? Perfect. <laughs> so this is an image, let me take that circle out. This is an image of a woman named Polly Bemis in her wedding dress. This is 1890. This, this, on the back of the photograph, the caption says, or it's, it's written, Polly Bemis in her wedding dress. Polly Bemis, funny name for this woman, arrived in San Francisco in 1872. She seems to have been smuggled in because there were laws that forbade the importation of Chinese women who were oftentimes uh, brought in for purposes of prostitution. She came into the port of San Francisco, which would be normal. And then she seems to have been smuggled to Portland and then smuggled into Idaho, where, uh, where according to some folklore, she was a sex worker and then she was then uh, uh, sort of held captive by a Chinese uh, entrepreneur who then lost her in a poker game to, to a man named, to a man named uh, Charles Bemis. Uh, we don't know if that part is true. We don't think that part is true. What we do know is that she, that, that she came in without papers in 1872. She ended, uh, she ended up in Warren, Idaho, where she ran a boarding house next to a saloon that was run by Charles Bemis, who was from Boston. And sometime in the late 1870s, they, they lived together and, and then were married in 1894. So the, so the caption on this image Polly Beam is in a wedding dress may in fact be true. Okay, so, so what I like about, about starting with this image is it fits the narrative of, say, Asian American studies, where the story of Chinese immigration in the late 19th century is about Americanization, it's about exclusion, it's about all of these, all of these facts, right? So, so Polly Bemis has been, in fact, celebrated in Asian American history as an example of a, an extraordinary a woman who beat the odds of sex work and ended up being her own person. She, you know, she and Charlie Bemis then, then owned a farm. She was very popular, popular in, the, in, in the town. Uh, she lived until a ripe age in, in, until 1933. Um, you know, very, and there, her house is now sort of a, a, a landmark in Idaho. So, so Polly Bemis then has become this icon, icon of Asian Americans or Asian immigrants coming to the United States and becoming successful. It's, you know, it's that narrative. Right. What, what did you call it earlier today? The Immaculate Conception it sort of falls and then, then there it is. All right, so, so I would like to, to now read this, this image through what research has shown us. Right. So actually, we don't know that this, book, that this book is a Bible. And we know this sort of because I asked my good friend Seth Perry, who is an expert on the Bible in the 19th century at Princeton, uh, and. Um, in our little emails, he said, he said, it's probably not a Bible because a Bible that big would have been very expensive. It would have been a luxury item in rural Idaho. He says, most likely it is just a big book that's, a, that's the photographer's prop, right? So, we, you know, so that already destabilizes that narrative. Uh, Polly Bemis, um, you know, so why take this photograph? Well, as it turns out, Polly Bemis, because she, because she was smuggled in, possibly dressed as a man, that's another detail that we won't get into, she didn't have paperwork that allowed her to be in, to be in the nation. She was undocumented, as it were, right? So, so, in 1890, so in 1892, the Geary Act required that all Chinese residents of the United States have papers certifying that they were, in fact, here legally. Polly didn't have it. So that was the occasion so the story goes, when Charles Bemis offered to marry her so that she could gain citizenship, even though it was illegal for, for whites to marry Asians in Idaho, that the presiding judge had married a Native American woman, so he was like, I, I can do it whatever I want, right? 
Um, so then in 18, 1893, before they got married, however, it, the, the Congress passed what's called the McCreary Amendment. And the McCreary Amendment required now that not only do the Chinese residents in the US have papers of, of, of certificates of residency, but they also had to have photographs taken of themselves to register with the federal government. And in, and in 1893, the McCreary Amendment was, was noted for the fact that the only other population in the United States that required photographs were criminals, right? So, you know, so, so this, this picture was likely on the occasion of Polly Bemis having to register for the federal government. We don't know that this was her wedding dress, but, but the dates line up. And someone suggested that, in fact, you know, if she's Chinese, maybe the dress is red for good luck, which is why the color is interesting, right? The other thing about Polly Bemis' name is as her, her name, it, her original name wasn't, isn't Polly Bemis. Uh, there's some confusion about why her name is Polly. It, it appears that her first name was really Lalu, L-A-L-U, and last, last name N-A-T-H-O-Y, Nathoy, pronounced Nasoy. Lalu Nasoy doesn't sound like a Han Chinese name. So more research and more digging of Polly Bemis, turn, it turns out that the region that, re the region that she's from in northern China was, it was a, an area that overlapped with, 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 Mon with Mongol peoples, Mongol tribes. And we know that from her story that she didn't fraternize very, very much with the, with the southern Chinese that were in the area. She kind of was aloof from them. Uh, she did all the things that would be consistent with the life of Mongols who had been synthesized in northern China. And then her name, Lalu Nasoy, according to, according to an ethnographer in the People's Republic, uh, Nasoy is a family name, but the name Lalu could be interpreted as Islam. So it's possible we have this Mongolian woman, Islamic woman, living in Idaho, who has gone under the radar as good old Chinese American Polly Bemis success story, right? So, 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 the, so you know, like, I don't think we'll ever know, in fact, if she was a Mongolian woman or not. But, but there was one thing that really kind of tipped it for me, and that was a picture of Polly Bemis with her horses, Nellie and Julie, right? Uh, I mean, if you're, if, you're, if you're Mongolian, you've got to have a horse, right? She's got two here, right? So, so uh, I begin my course with this story because it, it upsets the, the, the narrative of what Asian American studies would like us to believe is the myth or is the story of Asians arriving, going through some troubles, and then coming up, as we know now in the, in the 20th and 21st century, as a, as a model minority. Right, and so, and so for me, religion kind of obsesses because you know if she's if she's a Muslim, well that makes us takes that that makes us pause. Right, this historical moment in our in Western history where we have this Asian Muslim woman, it just kind of upsets everything. All right, so teaching religion and race challenges assumptions and baked in narratives and stereotypes, just as Polly Bemis has shown. Right, so so my career is based upon this idea that these two things that you're not supposed to talk about in polite company, right, have become my bread and potatoes, right? And this is all, this is what I do 24 seven. And so for me, the, the joy is finding these narratives and, and pulling the rug out from the kinds of ideologies and dominant narratives of, of Americanism as a way to complicate the picture. So issues of race, ethnicity, and alterity are always present in the history of religions and in the teaching of religion. We only need to think of the origins of the discipline in colonialism, in, in uh, the British administration of India, right? And the discovery of Sanskrit by Sir William Jones, right? Uh, that, that, you know, and the, and the, and the move from, from Missionswissenschaft into Religionswissenschaft as this way to understand cultures as a way to dominate them. So this administrative, military, linguistic, scholarly orientalism then becomes very much a part of the creation or the, the construction of even the, 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 the world's religions list, right? So when I ask my students to, to help me construct a list of the, of the great world's religions, and it's the usual suspects. You know, is uh, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, all the isms, and then they have trouble locating. Because I, 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 I want them to tell me what the Asian religions are. They have trouble with Islam, they have trouble with Christianity, and they have trouble with with, with Judaism. And I, and I say, look at the map. All of these religions come from Asia. Where are the religions 
of the Americas on the list of the great world's religions. Why is that, right? And so we then talk about the kinds of, of assumptions and biases in creating a list of world religions. You've got to have a book, you've got to have a founder, usually male, right? Scripture is important, you've got to have a set of doctrines, you've got to have a religious specialist, dot, 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 dot. Right, so, so already we're beginning, even, even with, the, with, the, with the, the initial foray into what religion is, we have to step back and talk about how do we understand the, the, the creation of the study of religion as innocent, as not innocent history. Right? So students learn very quickly that the study of religion is not innocent. It is complicit with all kinds of asymmetrical power relationships. Okay? All right. So I want to focus my comments today on Asian American Christianity. Um, I, found, I found it interesting yesterday that Professor Ben Simone didn't talk about Asian Americans very much, right? Minoritized religions, Latinx and African Americans, Native Americans. And I think that, that maybe the Asian American material might be a little more difficult for, for, the, for those projects because of this, of this stereotyping of Asians as overrepresented in, in higher education, et cetera. Right? We can talk about that if you want to, but what, where I want to go with it is I want, to, I want to focus in on Asian American Christianity for two basic reasons. One is I want to dissenter the tendency in the teaching and study of American religion to focus on Native American traditional beliefs and practices, African American Christianity, the black church, Latinx devotional folk Catholicism, right? So, these are, so you know, when you do a course on American religion and you, want to, and you want to do diversity, these are the things you get. These are the low hanging fruits, right? You know, but also I want to focus on Asian American Christianity to disorient religion in Asian America as stereotypically Buddhist or expressing esoteric oriental wisdom, technique, yoga, tai chi, right? Or philosophy, right? So there's something about Asian religions that are, that are somehow different from the other ones. And then if you, and, but if you study Asian Americans or Asians in America, you want to study those things, not so much Christianity. When, you know, when in fact, if you look at the numbers, we see that, that at least in 2012, for Asian Americans 18 and over, we see that Christians represent 42% of the, of the adult population, right? And of that, of that 20, 42%, about 19% is evangelical. Um, uh, what worries me, though, in this chart is, is the 26% the unaffiliated, right? Spiritual but not religious, the religious nuns. I'm out of a job in 10 years, right? <laughs> right? Chinese Americans, it's 30%, right? No religious affiliation, right? So, it's in the, so you know, fun with statistics, but I, but I you know, I, and I tell my students who come, who take my class because they want the oriental stuff, I say, if we do this course by the, by the percentages, we're gonna spend almost half the course in Christianity. And, and you wouldn't be in the class, after, because, you know, because we know what Christianity is, it's kind of boring, isn't Asian American Christianity just like white Christianity? Right? So take my class, right? Okay, good. Questions at this point? Comments? Because I'm going to have some water. Okay, I want to talk about some examples of what I mean. So this is a 1960s photograph of the St. Mary's Mission in San Francisco, which is no longer there on Broadway Street. At first glance, if you're squinting, you might think this was a, a Buddhist um, temple because of the, the Chinese language on the sides, uh, the, the decorations, the, the, you know, the, the, the oriental chinoiserie, right? And in, and in fact, even the, the furniture, the chairs, were in fact imported at the, in the renovation from a Taiwanese Buddhist temple, right? So there's all kinds of things here that would, that would make people squirm about whether or not this was actually a Catholic or not. But I want, to, I want to take a look at the figure, the figure on this side, which is an image of Madonna and Child. Now, when I show this photograph, I get this reaction only louder from students. Right? They're, you know, they, they, some of them laugh, some of them gasp, some of them look around nervously because they don't know what an appropriate response is. Right? But what I like about this photograph is it, is it, it demonstrates how, how, a, how an Asian American, Chinese American community in San Francisco has taken it upon themselves to make the religion, to indigenize their tradition, right? And, and, the, and the fascinating thing about this, about this, this icon, this image, is the, is the infant Jesus who is tonsured in, like royalty, like the baby Buddha, right? And so, so if, you're, if you're a Chinese immigrant Christian, 
and you and you're and you're coming from a from a place where Buddhism is popular, you walk into the mission and you see this statue of Madonna and Child, you're going to have a different feeling about it. There's going to be some some maybe discomfort, but also a kind of familiarity with it, right? You know, so why this image and not the standard image for this Chinese American mission? If the goal is enculturation or assimilation, right? This image is now on the top of the hill in San Francisco. If you, if you, if you ride the cable car all the way up to California Street to the very top, there's a red brick church in there. Go in there, turn right, go around the corner, and you'll see in full technicolor the Holy Family. Right. So next time you're in San Francisco, you must go see it. Okay. So then I do some history, in history and I talk about Christianity beyond Europe's captivity. And this is a very famous Nestorian stela, uh, dated 781, commemorating, it, comm commemorating the 631 arrival of Syriac Christians into the Western Kingdom. And the, the top of the monument says, is, declares memorial to the propagation in China of the luminous religion, which was the name for Christianity, Jing Zhao, of Da Qin, Da Qin meaning the eastern reaches of the Roman Empire. Some, some people think it's, it's Syria, right? And in fact, this, this large monument, which stands pretty tall, is mostly Chinese, but on the side, what confused the first Jesuits who saw it in 1625 was, was that it, they couldn't figure out what the script was and turned out to be Syriac. Uh, the, the Jesuits were hoping that this was evidence that Roman Catholics had been there before, but the Syriac kind of disabused them of that, of that, that thing, and they weren't very happy about it. But what I like about, what I like about this seal is it, is it offers you a, a narrative of Jesus. But notice the language and the imagery here on Jesus' narrative, right? So Jesus is introducing life and destroying death. We're all okay with that. He suspended the bright sun to invade the chambers of darkness and the falsehoods of the devil were thereupon defeated. He set in motion the vessel, or uh, a vehicle, of mercy by which to ascend to the bright mansions, whereupon rational beings were then released, having thus completed the ma manifestation of his power, in clear day he ascended to his true station. Right. If, you, you know, if, you, if you know Buddhism, what's being described here is, is the work of the Bodhisattva, right, who works on behalf of all sentient, irrational beings to be, to be released, right? So there's, a, so there's a real interesting moment in Tang Chinese uh, 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 religion where you have uh, Syriac Christianity entering and using the language of both Taoism and Buddhism to set up their text. In fact, they were commissioned by the king, by the emperor, to do this. And, and what you have in some of these uh, Tang Dynasty Christian text is the collaboration between the Syrian priests and Buddhist monks who are helping translate each other. So they're using the language here. The other, the other, my other favorite example is this uh, sutra on mysterious rest and joy. One of the one of the the more famous but understudied and underappreciated Chinese Christian text from the eighth century. And the sutra of mysterious rest and joy is is set up like a Buddhist sutra. In the Buddhist sutras, the, when the Buddha teaches, he's usually standing in front of a, a large crowd, and then one of then one of the one of the, the Buddha's disciples will, will stand up and ask him a question. Master, what about blah 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 blah? And in this text, we get the same format. Mishihe, which is from the Syriac for Messiah, says to Senwen Sanchi or Simon Peter, and this is what the Messiah says about salvation. In order to cultivate the superior way, and the word way here in the Chinese is Tao, right? First eliminate movement and desire. Kind of sounds like a little bit of Taoism, a little bit of maybe meditation, right? If you have no movement and desire, no desire, you will not seek and you will not act. This is straight out of Buddhism, right? No desire then releases you from, right, from, from pain. Right? If you have no seeking and no action, you will be able to be clear and pure. If you can be clear and pure, you will be able to understand and be enlightened. That's the same word that in Chinese is translated to Sanskrit, right? If you can understand and be enlightened, then you will comprehensively illuminate all surroundings. To comprehensively illuminate all surroundings is the cause for rest and joy. So the goal here is rest and joy and illuminating surroundings 
do the processes of possibly meditation or going back to the second century, back to Tatian and the Diatessaron, the idea of, of abstaining from, from, from meat, from, from sex, from alcohol, right? So, so, there, so there are all these really interesting transformations or connections all the way back to Persia that find a way, you know, across this huge distance across the Silk Road into Tang China, right? So students have trouble with this text. Professor, this is not a Christian text. Why not? Let's talk about it. And, you know, and, and, and where we end up after this initial conversation is the idea of Christianities, plural, that there are different kinds of Christianities. Here is one that is of a particular kind that has, that has, that has, has, uh, 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 gone on, 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 on religion Tinder and had swiped left with Buddhism and Taoism, <laughs> right? Now you're awake, right? Okay. I have to say that in class too, so they understand that part. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is, so this is really, you know, really uh, uh, working to, to undermine the kinds of assumptions that students have about what Christianity is. And, you know, I got lots of STEM students in my class who are there, because, there for the general ed requirement. And, you know, and, and many of them are evangelical Christians, and they, and they hit this text, and, and they resist. For good reason, they resist. But I also require them to be open to the possibility that there are other moments in the Christian tradition that are not held hostage to Plato, for example, right? Or, you know, or, or, you know the, the Church of the East and some of its friends, right, sort of forgot about Chalcedon, right? And, you know, and they are, you know, are they any less Christian than... Chalcedon Christians, right? All right. Okay, then I show, then, I, then I, later in the course, I show them this image. Anybody? I will give you 50 bucks if you tell me what this image is without Googling it right now. <laughs> oh, come on, it's easy. But you know it's a trick, right? Yeah, this is a this is a, a, a 13th or 14th century scroll that's hanging in a Rinzai Zen temple in Japan. Rinzai Rinzai Zen is the one where you know where that sudden awakening, right? And this temple, this image hung in this temple for three or four hundred years before a uh, scholar noticed something very strange about this image of presumably the Buddha, and it had to do with the hair. And it had to do with what he's holding in his hands. And what he's holding in his hands is a red lotus with a cross on it, with the, with the uh, what's called the cross of light. This is a, this is an, this is an image of, of the translation is, uh, is Jesus Buddha. Yeah, Yishu Fo, right? However, this is not a Christian image. This is a Manichaean image. And we know it's Jesus because Jesus has long hair, whereas if he had short hair, he would, it would be a, a, it would be a, a picture of, of, of Manny as the Buddha, right? But, you know, but here, here, is, here it's, very, it's very clearly in the dialect or in the format of Buddhism. And what you get in Manichaeism is this beautiful illustration of the way that religion Adapts to it, adapts to its culture. The Manichaeism, you know, which lasted from the time of Mani in mid third century, all the way into fourteenth or fifteenth century China. Marco Polo has a great story of finding these these uh, these mysterious Christians when he got there in twelve ninety two, and he someone says, well, you know, there are these people living over there who we don't know what they are. Go go talk to them. You know, you're from the west. You're a Christian. You know them. Go talk to them. He goes to talk to this community and he gains the confidence. You're like, who are you and why are you talking to us? Like any good community, right? A, a wary of the researcher. And, and he says, you know, I think you're Christians. I think you should go to the Khan and tell him that you want the, the protection of the Khanate. But before that, go to the, the representative of the Christians to the Khan's court and tell him that you want to be protected as Christians under the Khan. So, that happens, they go, they go to the Khan's court, and the Christian representative says, I have, I have read their scriptures, we've talked about it, these Manichaeans, these are Christians. And because of stuff like this, the Buddhist representative in the court, Khan's court said, well, no, no, wait a minute, we want to have them under our 
guys in, in Marco Polo's language because they are idolaters, right, in, the, in Marco Polo's language, right? So, so, so the text says, the Marco Polo's account says that the, the Christian representative to the Khan's court and the Buddhist representative had this debate before the Khan, finally the Khan got tired of, of, the, of the debate and asked the, the Manichaeans, with whom would you like to be under? And he, and he pointed to the Christians. Anyway, long story, I'm, one of my projects is on Manichaeism in, in Asia and then all that, but so I can go on and on. Right, so why is this image then, even, if, even though it's Manichaean, why is this a, an illegitimate or non-authentic image of Christ as much as this one is? Right, this is the very famous Warner Psalm in 1940, uh, Jesus, right, Jesus portrait. Right. So all kinds of upsetting of apple carts in, in, in this material, right? And, you know, and, and by now students are, 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 are a little bit unhappy because they're not getting the Zen, right? <laughs> you know, not only that, Christianity has crashed their party and is now in China, right? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> this is the image that my students love most. This is a stu this is a titled Asian Jesus Eating Pho in Space by an, uh, an, an LA artist named Ray Young Chu. You can, you can go online and, and buy you know, prints of it, right? And I show this image because one of my, one of my, my more recent uh, interest in science fiction is, uh, is, is first contact, right? What happens to religion when it goes, when it leaves Earth, right? Where, you know, which, which direction do Muslims pray to, right? Where is Jerusalem? Where is Mecca, right? And so, so, so putting Jesus in outer space raises all kinds of questions as, as, you know, as it did for the church when Giordano Bruno uh, 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 claimed that, that in fact, if God was a God of, of, of fecundity, the universe had to be filled with other beings. And the church said, no, no, we don't think so because then what about us? And does that mean Jesus had to die for the Klingons and for the Ferengi, and, <laughs> right? right? So, so the church you know, sent Giordano Bruno in 1600 to the Fior di Campo to you know, for a steak dinner, right? <laughs> and so, and so what, what I like about this image and why my Asian American students respond to this is because it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it allows them to enter into the question about Christianity through a, a, a medium, food, that, that, that we are obsessed with, right? So Jesus eating pho in outer space, you know, and, and I love the fact that, that the table number 12 on the, on the napkin holder, it's, I mean, it's beautiful, right? So, so I get lots of, of response papers. Like I have students uh, uh, write response papers every week. And, and when I show this image that week, it's all about G Jesus, Asian Jesus eating fun. There's something about this image that, you know, that, that, that removes him from the terrestrial sphere that allows for this kind of playfulness, right? Alterity, difference. Okay. All right, how much time do I have? Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Um, so, my students are still using the word Caucasian, and, and Professor Ben Simon yesterday talked about the word Caucasian as well, right? And so I, you know, I, I do this whole thing on, on because it's a, because I do a, a, a unit on history of, of uh, race theory, and the idea of, of of Caucasian always struck me as kind of weird and and wonderful, and and because I'm interested in the ways that religion and race and ethnicity are like this. I was wondering if Caucasian, in fact, had some of that in it, right? So I went back and I, and I looked at, at Johannes Blumenbach's On the Natural Variety of Mankind in English, the translation, right, of the original. And I'm, so I'm trying to find out, you know, what, what Caucasian is in this text. But of course, we, all, we know that Blumenbach's, Blumenbach's uh, uh, five-race typology is the one that we still have today. It's also the typology that, that was used in the early 20th century to, de to define uh, citizenship and immigration. Right? So Blumenbach is an important person because he still is with us. Right? So Blumenbach said five races, the Caucasian white race, the Mongolian yellow race, the Malayan brown race, the Ethiopian black race, and the American the red race. Right? So this stuff, you, we sort of, Breathe, right? We know, you know, we 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 usually bring it down to maybe four, but uh, the Malayan thing will give Filipinos a problem in the, in the 30s in California. But that's another that's another lecture, right? So Blumenbach then is responsible for, you know, in 1795, in his dissertation publication, his third edition, uh, for for what for the the idea that that white people should be called Caucasian, right? 
And because of the hour, I won't go through and read the whole thing, but basically what Blumenbach is arguing is that, is that, that uh, the Caucasus region has the most beautiful humanity. Right? The Georgians are beautiful, right? And it is there, he says, that we should look for uh, uh, probably the, to the place, the autochthones of mankind, the origins of mankind. Right? And then he goes on and on about skulls, which we don't have time to talk about, right? Then he, then he says that, that at the very bottom here, he says, um, it is very easy for that for, uh, it is white in color, which we may fairly assume to have been the primitive color of humanity, since as we have shown above in his uh, the previous chapters, it is very easy for that white to degenerate into brown, right? So white must be the pure category. And the other races must degenerate. He didn't really mean degenerate in the sense of, of, of moral value. He meant in terms of a, of, a, of a physical yellowing or browning or redding of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of what Benjamin Franklin would call the lily white. Okay, okay but why the Caucasus region? Uh, you know, if, you know there, are some, there are lots of beautiful people on the planet, but why the Caucasus? Does anybody know this? I love this. I, you know, I love this connection between race and and, and religion here. Well, okay, so here's, here's a picture of the Caucasus. I couldn't find it on the map if you gave it to me, but here it is. So for Blumenbach's reader in 1795, he didn't need a footnote like we would. The readership, the, 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 the literate people of his age would have understood that the Caucasus region was, of course, because of the biblical narrative of where Noah's Ark landed. And I just find it so wonderful, well, in a kind of terrorizing way, <laughs> wonderful th that, that this notion of, 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 of Caucasian goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapter 8. It, I mean, it's astounding to me how, how, how stick to it right? These narratives continue to be with us. You know, you know, so much so that the language of, the language of, of who is a Caucasian will enter into all of the, the citizenship debates in the 20s and 30s for Asian Americans and their attempts to try and become citizens. Right? It's an appeal back to Blumenbach. And of course, Blumenbach is then using this biblical, this, this Hebrew Bible story to substantiate the science that then informs public policy in the 20th century. Beautiful, right? Horrifyingly beautiful. Okay, I'm almost done. All right. Okay, so there's a long history of equating biblical religion and Christianity with Caucasian peoples, as we've just seen. The origins of the modern concept of race has its origins in the Christian worldview. Uh, we could go on and on about, about these other 19th century figures. Uh, and, of, and of course, the word ethnic, right, comes and originally, originally meant not Christian or Jewish, pagan or heathen, right? So in, so, so in a sense, right, the, the race history is stacked against right, non-white people because of this very long history of scientific affirmation of biblical stories and the assumption that, that, that well, everybody knows this to be true, this kind, of, this kind of hegemonic ideological view of what is true because everybody says it is, or the, or the text say it is. Okay, so religious studies is, it tends to be a very conservative um, Discipline, right? You know, a lot of us, a lot of my colleagues, are stuck with their heads in books. Right? At my at my first job as as the, as the only Americanist in the department, one of the, a student once said to me, "Professor, you're the only person who studies living people." And I'm like, yeah, I got to leave this job, <laughs> right? Right. So religious studies is you know is 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 very much locked into into a kind of academic ivory tower, whereas whereas on the other side, ethnic studies right has a different mission at the university, which is about representing. Uh, communities of color and, and, for, and for students to see themselves represented in the curriculum. But also ethnic studies also sees the university not as the ivory tower the way religious studies does, but as a place for activism, as a place for, for, for moving forward the community, for bringing people with them. Right? So, my, so my work is, is, kind of, you know, is, is kind of this lopsided thing, having to make the religious studies faculty happy, but also making, trying, to, trying to make the ethnic studies people see that I'm not crazy because I actually like books, right? And I actually like the kind of deep, weird study, right? So there's a kind of tension in this, in this configuration of race and religion. And, I, and, I, and the way that I go about my work is through, what, is through counterdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity is good if you share tools to help you unlock some secrets. But it's really counterdisciplinarity, I find, where the magic happens. Because counterdisciplinarity 
is refusing to rely on the regimes of traditional disciplines as an act of academic disloyalty. You know, you know students, you're all, you're, all, you're all in a discipline. And I think the word discipline is appropriate here, right? <laughs> you know, this is how you read a text. This is how you do a formula. This is how we, how we do footnotes, right? You are trained to, to see data in particular ways with particular trendy currents that are happening in the theoretical realm. Counterdisciplinarity says, wait a minute. I know that stuff, but I, but I would like to allow the data to suggest its own analysis. Right? Polly Bemis's image. I've known that image since graduate school. But when I decided that I was going to set aside the Asian American Studies historical narrative and start reading around and looking at other stuff, it was like, oh, okay, much more interesting than we thought. Another project that I was working on was, was discovering that, that, that there was a living Buddha from Mongolia in the United States from 1949 to 1965, but not finding his name mentioned anywhere in either the Buddhism in American literature or the, or the Asian American history literature. It was only through finding an image and then saying, okay, who is this guy? Where do I go to find this stuff? I'm not listening to Asian American studies history because they're, they're not helping me. And the religious studies, the Buddhist studies stuff isn't helping me either, right? So, so this counterdisciplinarity then for me is, what, is, what, is what, allows for a kind of, not just the academic disloyalty part, which I love of course, but, but, it's, but it's, it's, it's freeing the scholar up to ask questions that you maybe shouldn't ask in front of your advisor, <laughs> right? Finally, religion and race, subjects of fear and misunderstanding as productive wedges in the institution, right? make, that, make that insurgency, for giving students critical tools in the classroom and fostering a, hermen a hermeneutic of suspicion. I think I have two more slides. Oh, this is a whole other thing, right? So the last thing I was going to talk about, which, which, I'm, which I won't talk about just very much, is just the idea that, the, that institutions of higher education are, are part of what's called the white spatial imaginary. And this is a, an idea that comes out of uh, my, my colleague in black studies at, 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 at Santa Barbara, George Lipsitz, in an article called The Racialization of Space and the Spatialization of Race. I wish I had come up with that title. And basically what, what, what Lipsitz is, is talking about is, is you know, he, he notes that, that in uh, in the way that land is parsed out, that, there's, that there are asymmetrical power relationships that have to do with exclusivity and augmented exchange value. In other words, you buy a property because you can turn, flip it and make more money. Right? And the university, that, that, that exchange value is in education. You go, to, you go to college to be able to give you more value once you get out. And that this, this white spatial imaginary functions as a central mechanism for skewing opportunities and life chances in the United States along racial lines. Lipsis is talking about things about like housing covenants and redlining and gated communities. But, but this would also apply to the university as a place where the, 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 the space is built as a place that is, un, that is uh, 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 unwelcoming of minority students or gay and lesbian students, transgender students, right? So Lipset says we should stage a confrontation between the white special imaginary and the moral geography of differentiated space as I have de developed among aggrieved as have been developed among aggrieved communities of color. What he means is basically that in a, if for the, at the university, uh, students, of, students of aggrieved communities of color should not be forced to integrate in the, in the lunch counter, in the lunch room, as a, as, a, as a symbol of multiculturalism, which is a toothless ideology, but they should be allowed to, to have their own spaces, their own cultures, their own agency within the structures of a university that is already set up to be unwelcome to them, right? You know, and, and, and I, you know, I liked yesterday when, when, when Professor Ben Simone was talking about the actors and the artifacts that, that can be used to move students through success. I'm all for that, but I think that also that, that, that you know, at UCSB we have this, we have this uh, uh, commitment to, to multiculturalism, which just means that everybody gets their month. And then after the month, see you later. See, we know, wait for 12 months. Everybody is not the same. Some people don't want to have a month, right? So, so being attentive to the way that, the way that, that, that aggrieved communities, as, as uh, Lipset says here, is really important in trying to work towards, towards issues of equity. That's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>